In our last episode of War of the Worldviews, we looked at the real Jesus and the attacks being made against him by modern so-called scholarship. We also considered how the mainstream media has been complicit through their popularization of these attacks. In tonight's episode, we continue to explore this assault, this time focusing on another growing front in the battle, the redefining of who Jesus and Christianity is by people who profess to love and follow Him, that is, by members of quasi-Christian cults. Just who are they, and how does one go about identifying them as a cult? A group that claims to be Christian, but deviates from the defining doctrines of Christianity. The cult leader or the organization itself becomes the savior. As it says in Jude, uh, we are to contend for the faith. They suffer tremendous humiliation at the hands of leaders who are not leading like Jesus did. Taking Christian terminology, but applying totally different definitions to it. And lo and behold, you have a cult. A cult is born. He said, you guys believe in a different God than we do. Church does not define what Scripture is. Scripture creates the church. It is evil to pervert the Word of God. Hi there, I'm Elder Smith and this is Elder Pascal. Hi, I'm Younger Joan. Sorry, it's just that I'm the youngest of three sisters. Got it. We're from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We have a program that's been proven to strengthen families and we'd be honored to share it with you, absolutely free of charge. Are you interested? Well, I already attend church. Redeemer Presbyterian, right down the road? That's wonderful. This is information that all faiths can benefit from. And if you'll allow us to come in, we can tell you more about it. Well, to be completely honest, I believe that as Mormons, you are members of an anti-Christian cult. To invite you in would be a violation of the Apostle John's command to not receive anyone into your home who comes preaching another gospel. I'm sorry, but I'm not interested. And if I could just make a suggestion, read the Bible. Ask the Holy Spirit to show you the truth about God the Son. I'll be praying for you. Goodbye. In today's religiously diverse and relativistic culture, taking a stand like Joan does here may seem extreme to many people, if not downright rude. And even those who believe in the concept of absolute truth and even further believe that Jesus is the only way to eternal life can still get confused about what is what. Just why are Baptists properly considered Christians while Mormons aren't? And why is a Jehovah's Witness religion classified as an anti-Christian cult while Presbyterians, Wesleyans, and Pentecostals are simply seen as denominations within the Christian faith? With the explosion of different sects that claim to honor and follow Jesus, how does one differentiate between true biblical Christianity and an aberrant religious movement. Just what are the marks of a cult? Some may view the term cult as being harsh, unloving, judgmental, and even un-American. This is, after all, a nation known for tolerance and religious freedom. If someone is sincere, who are we to judge their beliefs or label them with a negative term like cult? I would turn it around and say it's unfair and unkind for them to claim uh, that kind of identification, especially when they import new meanings into what is historic Christian uh, terminology and doctrine. So I really think the unkindness and unfairness is, is really that of the individual who we would identify as a cult, that is an individual especially who uh, departs from historic Christian teachings. The problem is in America we don't have any religious uh, fair labeling laws. You know, you couldn't get away with this if you were uh, selling a product and you mislabeled it in the stores. The, the ingredients have to be there on the label. In Christianity you, ha you don't have that, so anyone can come along and say, 
I, I'm a Buddhist Christian or I believe in Mohammed, but I'm a Christian. There's, there's no way that you can uh, legislate that. Everyone involved with this presentation would defend people's right to worship or not worship as they please. If someone wants to devote themselves to Jesus or Aphrodite or nature or money or pleasure or a political ideology or themselves, both the God of the Bible and our Constitution give them that freedom. I've got to go into a meeting, 10 minutes. Uh, the Fed's getting ready to announce whether or not they're going to raise rates. I need to be there. If Trinidad calls, tell them if IBM gets a 64, they need to put a market order in for 2,000 shares. That's very important that they know that. Oh, wait a minute. Make sure that I have 20 copies of the latest edition of Milton Friedman's book about capitalism in America. I've got to give those to my clients. But devotion to a particular ideology means embracing and being faithful to a specific set of beliefs. No true communist, for example, would support making a living from buying and selling stocks. Neither would they tolerate the teachings of Adam Smith or Milton Friedman. A person who did such things would simply be labeled, for the sake of clarity and definition, a capitalist or an anti-communist. Well, in precisely the same way, no person or organization can call itself Christian if they don't embrace the central tenets that gave rise and definition to the term Christian. And if they actively deny those tenets or refer to anyone who does believe them as being wrong or deceived, they can be fairly termed anti-Christ. I can't believe that you won't accept me as a Christian. Uh -huh. I mean, look at the good that Mormons do. Yeah, it's the but same good that Christ taught us to no, do. No, it's not. Yeah, it is. And more, hold on. More importantly, I believe in Christ. Yeah, okay. And I well, believe that well, He died you, on the cross for my sins. Yeah, James. you say you believe in Christ. The latter day saints say they believe in Christ, but it's a different Christ than the one the Bible teaches. I mean, you believe in a Christ that dies for a much different reason. I completely disagree with you. And in fact, I think that's nitpicking. That's it's all not. That is. It's not nitpicking. Okay, what if I were to put it this way? What if somebody or myself <laughs> sincerely believed? that the angel Lucifer came down, visited the prophetess Josephine Smith. Ah, Josephine Smith. Josephine okay. Smith. Took her to That's some good. lead tablets that were written by the king of Atlantis. It's crazy. Okay, I know it's crazy, but I'm making a point, so let me finish and you'll understand. Okay. What if those tablets said that Christians are supposed to hang out until the end of time, wait for Christ's return so they can rule their own planet someday as gods, right? Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, they're supposed to abstain from sex and become fruitarians. Okay, if I sincerely believe, where was this here? If I sincerely believe that, would you consider me a Mormon? Of course not. Okay, and why not? Well, the Church of Latter-day Saints doesn't teach that, doesn't expect us to believe in any kind of nonsense like well, that. Well, except for the part of ruling your own planet as gods. But that's my point, is the Bible has some very specific foundational things that are expected to be believed, and the Mormons have veered away from those. In fact, in some cases, it's the exact opposite. That's why I can love you like a friend, and I do, but you and I can't be considered brothers in Christ. It should be obvious if you think about it. Claiming to be a Christian doesn't make you a true follower of Christ any more than calling yourself a vegetarian makes you one regardless of what you believe or do. In order to be a Christian, you must submit yourself completely to Christ and believe the Bible and its teachings. The second reason we must know the marks of a cult and not be afraid to use the label is that we are commanded by Scripture to protect the apostolic faith and to condemn any misrepresentations of the Lord Jesus and His Word. Almost every one of the New Testament books addresses the need to speak the truth and to avoid error. The only way you can avoid error is by identifying it and by saying it's wrong in comparison with this standard. The word Christian means something. Um, Christianity has always been associated with a certain belief system, with a worldview, uh, that there is one God who exists in three persons, who has revealed himself in Jesus Christ, and that revelation is recorded for us in the Holy Scriptures that have been passed down by other Christians through the church for 2,000 years. As it says in Jude, uh, that uh, we are to contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. So the Christian faith has a certain set of beliefs that, uh, that uh, comprise what it means to be a Christian. And if someone believes something that contradicts that set of beliefs or it somehow goes beyond 
what that set of beliefs uh, is all about, then, then by definition, they have departed from that Christian faith. For the true Christian, defending the faith is not an option. It's a solemn responsibility. There are several verses that make this clear, but let's consider a few points found in the third verse of the book of Jude. Beloved, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. First, note that Jude says the faith and not faiths. There is only one holy apostolic faith. Next, we can see that Jude describes this faith as being once for all delivered to the saints. This means that it's universal and immutable or unchangeable, that nothing is to be added to or taken away. There will never be a need to revise the faith in some way in order to make it more relevant to a particular people or generation. Finally, we are commanded to contend. In the original Greek, to epagonizomi, to struggle earnestly, to strive for this holy, immutable, apostolic faith. He is addressing all believers. And when he says that we are to, uh, to contend for the faith, he uses a word that's extremely descriptive. It's the, the term that eventually comes into our language as agonize. Well, we are to agonize for the faith, the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. This means that there will be those who will attempt to twist and pervert the faith. We have a holy obligation to actively resist and expose their doctrine as false and ultimately satanic. And as we'll see, this earnest defense of the faith isn't directed so much at pagan belief systems, though there's certainly a place for that as well. No, the apostles were far more concerned about heretical beliefs that would spring up from within the church. Teachings that had the appearance of being Christian and biblical, but were in reality distortions of the truth. For I know this, Paul said, that after my departure, savage wolves would come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after themselves. There will be false teachers among you. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. It is not surprising then if his, speaking of Satan, servants masquerade as servants of righteousness. Over 25 times in the New Testament alone, God warns us about the potential for deception from Satan, from false teachers, and from within ourselves. In fact, there are few things in scripture that are emphasized more. Understanding this innate and ever-present susceptibility to deception, we must be all the more vigilant concerning the things we believe, making sure that we trust in the Lord with all our hearts and lean not to our own understandings. And here we would also do well to remember another vital truth. For something to be true, it has to be completely true. Inject into it even the smallest falsehood and we are left with a lie, one that is all the more powerful and deceptive because of its proximity to the real thing. We live in a time when cults are sprouting up everywhere and thriving like weeds. There are many reasons for this, the growth of moral relativism and multiculturalism, coupled with the explosion of information transfer technologies, are among the more notable. But there is perhaps one preeminent reason, one that is completely the fault of the church. The Bible declares that the church is the pillar and buttress of the truth, a fortress that stands against the father of all lies, the evil deceiving spirit that ultimately stands behind every cult. Furthermore, Christians are called to be salt and light, a people who can restrain sinful man's natural tendency towards spiritual decay and darkness. 
it's amazing what you can get Christians to do to fight moral evil. But they won't do that in the theological realm because they don't see that there is an ethical aspect of God's truth at that level. As Dr. Walter Martin, perhaps our generation's most noted expert on the cults, observed, the cults have capitalized upon the failure of the Christian church to understand their own teachings and to develop a workable methodology, both to evangelize and to refute cult adherents. One of the things that is just really the most unfortunate thing of our day and age is we've got more information above and in front of us with the internet, with books, uh, books on CD, uh, and we are just unlearned. We are an ignorant church. Our prayer is that this presentation will not only help deliver people from the influence of cultic theology, it will also inspire a new love for biblical truth among God's chosen people. May the church once again fulfill her calling to be the foundation and protector of the only truth that can set men free. That clip, as well as others we'll look at tonight, comes from a documentary we produced entitled The Marks of a Cult. We'll show you later how you can get a copy as well as this show. But before we get into what specifically demarcates a group as a, quote, Christian cult, some definitions are in order. Something that's out of the mainstream, certainly way out of the mainstream, if it wasn't, uh, it wouldn't be called a cult. A religious sect that's anti-something, like they have a cause and they're willing to die for it, it's just like really strong. A group with one very strong charismatic leader that proposed a better way of life, but yet took advantage of his followers. A group of people who, uh, I guess, they don't really think for themselves, and they just kind of follow one guy blindly, kind of like the lemons off a cliff. I think of that Wiccan stuff with that, you know, the pentagram on the floor and that business, but that's just me. Fanatics. Mind control. Brainwashing. Witchcraft. Sexual deviance. Uh, satanic, demonic groups of people come together for evil purpose. I also think of like anti-government communism stuff too. Sun Yun Moon. <laughs> that guy, the Heaven's Gate guy. You hear about that business? The Jim Jones cult and the running shoes and you know, just the basic, basic you know, cl cliche image, you know, everyone in white robes, beards, glass of punch. Anybody that says, if you don't do this, you, you know, you're not going to heaven or anything like that, that's a cult. Anybody that says, we know the way and this is the way, unless you do it this way, you're not going anywhere, that's a cult, my friend. Most conventional religions now were cults at one time. And so, it, you know, a cult is only, if it lasts a while, it'll soon be uh, part of the social mores and it'll be accepted in that way. Proper definitions are essential to real communication and understanding. Anytime people use the same term but don't mean the same thing by it, confusion and misunderstanding inevitably result. Many times it's not unusual to run across uh, individuals who share certain vocabulary that Christians or evangelicals uh, do and as a result you have to stop and say now let me understand what it is you mean by that and let me explain to you what I mean by that and in the process of uh, that give and take you find out what the differences are and you can get to the heart of the issue more effectively. So what exactly do we mean by the term cult? Well like many words it has more than one meaning. So we'll begin with its etymological root, the original Latin word cultus, from which we get our modern term. Its classical meaning encompassed worship, adoration, honor, service, respect, observance, and attendance, terms that we would associate with religious duty. Working from this Latin root, our modern dictionaries define cult in its primary sense as a system of religious worship or ritual a devoted attachment to or extravagant admiration for a person or principle and a group of followers. But this is not what most people think about when the word cult is used today. 
and it's certainly not the way we are using the term in this presentation. Focusing on the more common use of the word cult, that is, as a negative term used to describe aberrant beliefs or practices, one non-Christian cult watch group defines it using the acronym BITE, or BITE. They explain that when a person or group exerts behavior control, information control, thought control, and emotion control over its followers, then that group should be classified as a cult. Though this is helpful, from a biblical perspective, there are still some problems with the definition. In the end, it's based upon human observation and not the Word of God. Therefore, it doesn't address the theological landmines that, if believed, will result in a person losing his eternal soul. To dial in on the word as it would be defined in the context of an explicitly biblical worldview, Dr. Walter Martin defined a cult as a group of people polarized around someone's interpretation of the Bible and characterized by major deviations from Orthodox Christianity relative to the cardinal doctrines of the Christian faith, particularly the fact that God became man in Jesus Christ. In his book, Confronting the Cults, Dr. Gordon Lewis was even more specific. A cult is any religious movement which claims the backing of Christ or the Bible, but distorts the central message of Christianity by an additional revelation and, two, by displacing a fundamental tenet of the faith with a secondary matter. Although these definitions are accurate and helpful, we're going to make them a bit more memorable by using the most basic symbols of mathematics, add, subtract, multiply, and divide. A group can be classified as a cult when they, number one, add to the 66 books of the Bible. The group does this by relying on some new so-called revelation, either new scriptures or by the discovery of an interpretive key to the Bible that has somehow been hidden from the historic church. Number two, subtract from the triunity of God by either denying the personhood or the deity of one or more members of the Godhead. Number three, multiply works necessary for salvation. And number four, divide the loyalties of their followers from God and the historic and universal church by focusing on salvation as the exclusive province of their particular group. It's important to understand that while the major cults deny the foundational doctrines of the Christian faith, they still insist they're Christian, often the only or at least the truest Christians. And this is the reason why the historic church has classified them as counterfeit or anti-Christian cults rather than as pagan or non-Christian religions. The difference between a cult and a world religion is, and by world religion I mean like Buddhism or Hinduism or something of the like, is these groups do not claim to be Christian. What makes a group a cult, at least according to Christian terminology, is they claim to be Christian and yet they deny the cardinal doctrines of the Christian faith. Throughout this presentation, we will refer to several historic creeds and confessions of the church. In an era when creeds and confessions have fallen on hard times, it would be good to remind ourselves why they're so important. The word creed comes from the Latin meaning credo, it's simply I believe. And I know it sounds good to say no creed but Christ, no book but the Bible, but it's actually contradictory because when you say that, you have a creed. Now, the question I always like when somebody says that, which Christ? No creed but Christ. Well, which Christ? The Mormon Christ, who's the spirit brother of Satan? The Jehovah's Witness Christ, who is subordinate to the Father? I mean, what Christ are you going to define? And the minute they define a Christ, they're creating or expanding upon their creed. Same thing with the Bible. No creed but Christ, no book but the Bible. Well, what do you consider the Bible? Um, the 66 books of the Protestant Bible or the 80 books of the Roman Catholic Bible? How about the Mormon editions, the Doctrines and Covenants, the Pearl of Great Price? What about the Jehovah's Witness Bible known as the New World Translation? 
Um, you can go on and on, Mary Baker Eddy and Science and Health with Keys to the Scripture. You can add all sorts of things to the Bible, so you got to define what's the Bible. That's why every Reformation creed defines the Bible as the 66 books which constitute the Old and the New Testament. So to say no creed but Christ, no book but the Bible sounds good, maybe even makes you sound a little holy, but in the end it's meaningless. So now, let's look more closely at the marks of a cult. Understanding the marks of a cult is important relative to the worldview wars for a number of reasons, not the least of which is the squishiness that characterizes so much of today's church. The seeds of relativism, pragmatism, political correctness, and individualism have grown to produce a crop of Christians, and even Christian leaders, who no longer seem able to defend or even articulate the radical person and nation-changing faith championed by the historic church. And what about Mitt Romney? And, and i got to ask you the question, because it is a question, whether it should be or not in this campaign, is a Mormon a true Christian? Well, in my mind they are. Mitt Romney has said that he believes in Christ as his Savior, and that's what I believe, so... I don't like singling out Joel Osteen here, a man who has a gift of encouragement and imparting hope for which we need to be thankful. But we simply have to face and grapple with this type of squishiness. And he is far from being alone in failing to defend biblical orthodoxy in this area. And I also don't want to single out just Mormons. There are lots of other heretical so-called Christian groups to choose from. But it's worth taking a moment here to focus on the Church of Latter-day Saints, or Mormons, because of its growing popularity and its numerous high-profile members, including Senator Orrin Hatch, ex-governor and presidential candidate Mitt Romney, and the lovable and provocative, in the best sort of way, Glenn Beck. Why? And he said, well, you really going on the church tour? And I said, oh, freak boy, calm down. I ain't going to your church. He's a Mormon. And I said, there is no way I'm going to be a Mormon. And he said, you owe it to me and my friendship. We've been friends through thick and thin for 20 years. You owe it to me to go one Sunday. It just feels so warm inside. And so we started to, uh, we started to go, and I realized that he was the most genuine person I had ever met. And um, it, was, it was then that I thought, I don't care if there's Kool-Aid down in the basement, I'm drinking it, because I want to be, I want to be like that, you know? There's a full court press going on now to present Mormonism as just another Christian denomination. And like its past support for polygamy and its exclusion from blacks from its priesthood, the organization now downplays its once front and center position that it is the true church, that, in classic cult fashion, the revelations of its founder, Joseph Smith, represented the restoration of the true Christian faith that had been suppressed and lost for over a millennia. When I was a university student, however, I became acquainted with the members and teachings of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, a Christian faith centered on the Savior. I began to learn about the doctrine of the restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ in these latter days. I learned truths that I had not known before that changed my life and how I viewed the gospel. The first restored truth that I learned was the nature of the Godhead. It was a stunning awakening for me to finally understand the truth about the nature of God, the Eternal Father, and His only begotten Son. The second restored truth I learned as an investigator of this church was the reality of additional scripture and revelation. The Book of Mormon, as it says on the cover, is another testament of Jesus Christ, and it is the missing piece. The Bible, I think, there are a lot of things that seem to be missing and some contradictions and some bits and pieces that just don't really make sense. But as soon as you put the Book of Mormon into it, everything just makes sense and it becomes a whole story. I learned about the restoration of the gospel through Joseph Smith and how Joseph Smith had some of the same confusion that I had, that he wanted to know which was the true Christianity 
and wanted to know how there could be so many different churches. And when he prayed to find out, God told him that he was going to restore the true form of, of Christianity, the Church of Jesus Christ, through him to the earth again. I mean, let's apply some straightforward logic here. If the true faith had been suppressed and lost until Joseph Smith recovered it, then all other Christian sects who believe in things like the Trinity, the Apostles and Nicene Creeds, just to name three foundational truths that Christians have historically held to and that Mormons don't, well, there is no way around it. The traditional Christian has to be deceived. According to the law of non-contradiction, A cannot be equal to non-A. Orthodox Christianity, then, cannot simultaneously be deceived and at the same time non-deceived. The Trinity cannot be both true and false. And Mormonism, which teaches virtually dozens, perhaps hundreds of things that other Christians don't believe, and in fact, in more than a few instances, are very similar to things that have been condemned by early church councils as heresy, cannot be the same as the historic Christian church. Continuing now with our show, let's look at the first sign of a cult, addition, adding to the 66 books of the Bible, either by having a new word or a new so-called revelation that interprets the Bible in a whole new way. The first thing any false teacher has to do is to get rid of the corrective ability of the Word of God that would keep him from exercising authority over others. He has to develop a unique way to mute the Word of God, to gag God in His Word. Many other historic creeds and confessions could be cited, but consider the words of the Baptist Confession of 1689. The Holy Scripture is the only sufficient, certain, and infallible rule of all saving knowledge, faith, and obedience. And for the more sure establishment and comfort of the church against the corruption of the flesh and the malice of Satan and of the world, to commit the same wholly unto writing, which maketh the Holy Scriptures to be most necessary, those former ways of God's revealing His will unto His people being now ceased. The closure of the canon of Scripture is related to the whole issue of, of cults in that cults have a tendency to, to say, we have new revelation. This man is our prophet. That man is, is our prophet. This woman is our prophet. Because they don't recognize the completion of revelation in Scripture, they are left to be blown about by every wind of doctrine. Perhaps Dr. Curtis Crenshaw summed it up best. If anything is contrary to Scripture, it's wrong. If anything is the same as Scripture, it's not needed. If anything goes beyond Scripture, it has no authority. Anything that contradicts Scripture is necessarily false because God doesn't contradict Himself. Anything that goes uh, uh, beyond what Scripture says is not needed and is in fact not authoritative because God didn't say it and God told us that Scripture was enough. God told us that we live by every word that comes forth out of His mouth. That means I don't live by other things. And then anything that, uh, that neither contradicts Scripture nor goes, goes beyond Scripture but essentially just simply reproduces, repeats what Scripture says is superfluous. There are at least two reasons that come to mind as to why the canon must be closed. One, I believe the, the Bible itself indicates this. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, uh, we're told that in the past God spoke through the prophets in diverse ways, but uh, in these last days He has spoken, past tense, through His Son. The revelation of Jesus Christ is complete. Uh, when He came and His apostles who were commissioned by Him spoke uh, the words of Christ, uh, that's all that God intended to say to us. We have in the, New Test in the Old and New Testament canons um, all that God wants and intends to say to us. The book of Revelation confirms this in chapter 22 when it tells us not to add any other words to this book. We're told there in those verses that the canon is closed. Practically speaking, however, <clears throat> um, if the canon is not closed, then the canon ceases to be a canon. To say the Bible is our canon of Scripture is to say that it is the standard, it is the authority for faith and practice. 
And yet, if we allow for extra biblical revelations, for continuing information from God, uh, subsequent to the, the, the Bible, to the writing of the biblical books, then um, that canon ceases to be the final word. It ceases to be authoritative. A good example of adding to the Bible can be found in the writing of Charles Taze Russell, founder of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, better known as the Jehovah's Witnesses. Furthermore, not only do we find that people cannot see the divine plan in studying the Bible by itself, but we see also that if anyone lays the scripture studies aside, even after he has used them, after he has become familiar with them, after he has read them for 10 years, if he lays them aside and ignores them and goes to the Bible alone, though he has understood his Bible for 10 years, our experience shows that within two years, he goes into darkness. On the other hand, if he had merely read the scripture studies with their references and had not read a page of the Bible as such, he would be in the light at the end of the two years because he would have had the light of the scriptures. Russell's uh, statement there is really a, a, a wonderful admission that what the Bible teaches is historic Christianity's orthodox doctrines. And when he says, you will only stay in the light if you read the Bible along with my books to explain the Bible, well, what he's really doing there is acknowledging that the Bible doesn't teach what he says it teaches. And that if people will only study the Bible, they won't get what he wants them to get. So the Bible is an orthodox doctrine uh, document because it defines orthodoxy. And Charles Taze Russell was simply wanting us to put his writings above scripture in authority. If you dropped a Bible on an island where people had never heard of Christianity, what Russell is really saying is that they would never come to salvation because they don't have the benefit of having his studies in the scripture. They would never come to the theology of the Watchtower. As a matter of fact, Russell said that they would revert right back to the doctrines of Christendom. Since writing those words, Charles Taze Russell has fallen out of favor with the cult that sprang up from his teachings. But the Watchtower Society continues to echo the core idea expressed in this previous passage, that people need them if they are to properly understand the Bible. Thus, the Bible is an organizational book and belongs to the Christian congregation as an organization, not to individuals, regardless of how sincerely they may believe that they can interpret the Bible. For this reason, the Bible cannot be properly understood without Jehovah's visible organization in mind. They say that it's sufficient to read the Bible exclusively, either alone or in small groups at home. But strangely, through such Bible reading, they have reverted right back to the apostate doctrines that commentaries by Christendom's clergy were teaching 100 years ago. But you can't understand the Bible by itself, by yourself. That you have to have our literature to explain it to you. And then you can understand the, the grand sweep of what the Watchtower says is God's plan of, of salvation. But without their literature, you will never understand it. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, more commonly known as the Mormon Church, boldly and unequivocally acknowledges that their theology is substantively based on extra-biblical revelation. The official statement of faith of the LDS Article 8 states, we believe the Bible to be the Word of God as far as it is translated correctly. We also believe the Book of Mormon to be the Word of God. So there's a condition put on the Bible. It has to be translated correctly by them, but there's no condition put upon the Book of Mormon because the Book of Mormon is seen by the Mormon church as higher revelation. In fact, two other books besides the Book of Mormon are seen as being equal to the Bible. The way Joseph Smith said it is, we believe the Bible to be the Word of God as far as it is translated correctly. What he really meant to say was transmitted. They believe that through the, through the ages that the Bible's been uh, edited, that it's been redacted, that uh, many plain and precious things have been taken out of the Bible, so that the product we have now, we don't know if even one verse has escaped 
uh, without corruption through the centuries. So when they say they believe, they believe the Bible, there's a big caveat there. There's a big question mark there. When I was a Mormon, I was told that there are four scriptures. The Bible, the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, and the Pearl of Great Price. However, I was told only one of those books have error in it, and that would be the Bible. The truth is that Mormons really see their three books as being more divine and authoritative than today's Bible. Why? Because their books haven't been corrupted over the years. They are precisely as their prophet Joseph Smith recorded them. On the other hand, the Bible we have today, according to Smith and other leaders, is filled with errors and can therefore not be accepted as being completely accurate or trustworthy. I believe the Bible as it read, Smith declared, when it came from the pen of the original writers, ignorant translators, careless transcribers, or designing and corrupt priests have committed many errors. They have to ultimately deal with the authority of Scripture, either by denying the Scripture can be trusted, or to go in and actually change and alter the Scripture or even, of course, to add new scripture which supersedes or is superior to the scripture. Modern Mormonism, as in this quote from the 20th century apostle Bruce McConkie, continues to echo Joseph Smith's low view of today's Bible. Many plain and precious things were deleted from the Bible, in consequence of which error and falsehood poured into the churches. One of the great heresies of modern Christendom is the unfounded assumption that the Bible contains all of the inspired teachings now extant among men. I've never met a Mormon who would actually go to a specific passage and say, you see, this is wrongly translated for this reason. It's just an excuse. In the Restoration, according to Mormon beliefs, God used Joseph Smith to reestablish the true church with its apostles and priests as well as to recover the real Bible and the keys to its proper interpretation. Listen to the words of Orson Pratt, one of the original 12 apostles of the LDS Church. I saw his, Joseph Smith's, countenance lighted up as the inspiration of the Holy Ghost rested upon him, dictating the great and most precious revelations now printed for our guide. I saw him translating, by inspiration, the Old and New Testaments, and the inspired Book of Abraham from Egyptian papyrus. Joseph Smith's translation of the Old and New Testaments, it should be noted, included several thousand additions, deletions, and rearrangements of the ancient scriptures. Oddly enough, funny enough, the Book of Mormon itself does not teach Mormon theology. As a matter of fact, you can find enough scripture, biblical scripture in the Book of Mormon to contradict Mormonism. The reason for that is because Joseph Smith, when he wrote the King James, uh, wrote the uh, Book of Mormon, he plagiarized the King James Version of the Bible, uplifted hundreds of verses out of the King James Version and planted it in the Book of Mormon. Now, obviously, God in His providence has allowed that that we can use the Book of Mormon to actually lead a Mormon out of Mormonism because the Book of Mormon contradicts Mormonism. Their actual theology is contained much more in their Doctrine and Covenants and Pearl of Great Price. In the 2005 edition of The Religious Educator, a journal published by Brigham Young University, the primary Mormon college, the professor of ancient scripture, Joseph Fielding McConkie, was interviewed concerning his new book, The Bruce R. McConkie Story, Reflections of a Son. McConkie Sr., as we saw earlier, served as an apostle and preeminent theologian within the LDS Church. What was the most important principle your father shared with you about teaching the gospel? The single most important principle that I learned from my father was to be true to the revelations of the Restoration. They are the key, he said, by which we unlock the true meaning of all that was taught or revealed to the ancients. Along much the same lines, the Reverend Sun Myung Moon, founder of the Unification Church, attempts to justify his additions to the scriptures 
by first questioning the power, veracity, and relevance of using just the Bible. The Bible, however, is not the truth itself, but a textbook teaching the truth. Naturally, the quality of teaching and the method and extent of giving the truth must vary according to each age, for the truth is given to people of different ages who are at different spiritual and intellectual levels. Therefore, we must not regard the textbook as absolute in every detail. Another quote by Moon is even more revealing concerning his view of the authority and sufficiency of the scriptures. Until our mission with the Christians is over, we must quote the Bible and use it to explain the divine principle. After we receive the inheritance of the Christian church, we will be free to teach without the Bible. Reverend Moon takes the approach that many do. They want to use the Bible, keyword use. Uh, it's part of the sheep's clothing. They say we believe the Bible, they hold a Bible, they even quote occasionally from the Bible. The problem is that the Bible uh, is not inerrant, it's not the Word of God, it's far, uh, uncorrupted, and so what you need is you have to add something else on here to basically fix the Bible. In this case, it's the divine principle. And so Reverend Moon comes back and puts his theology on top of the Bible, and for uh, a uh, Unification Church member, the, the, the idea is that's going to always uh, supersede what the Bible says because the Bible, again, great book, it's scripture, but it's got error. Once you, once you do that, once you believe that the Bible has error and you have to look outside the Bible for Latter-day teachers or some other scripture or channeled information, basically you're set up that you can believe anything at that point. Christian Science and its founder, Mary Baker Eddy, took the same approach as her contemporary, Joseph Smith, in adding to the Bible, daring first to question its authenticity. The decision by vote of church councils as to what should and should not be considered holy writ, the manifest mistakes in the ancient versions, the 30,000 different readings in the Old Testament, and the 300,000 in the New, these facts show how a mortal and material sense stole into the divine record, with its own hue darkening to some extent the inspired pages. And Mary Baker Eddy definitely adds to the Word of God. What she does, again, in using the Bible, science and health with key to the Scriptures, what she would say is that the Bible has mistakes in it, the various versions of the Bible. And so she says you need a key. Basically, she's saying the Bible's a great book, but it's locked. She has the key, the key to the Scriptures. What she does is she superimposes a metaphysical philosophy on top of the Bible so that very plain words, words like sin, sickness, death, completely reinterpreted so that you have it teaching the exact opposite of what the Bible would normally say. Mary Baker Eddy would say once you have the key to the scriptures you would realize there is no such thing as sin, sickness, or death. During the mid-1800s, Eddy, Smith, and Russell were joined by another supposed prophet whose revelations, it was claimed, was of the same quality or degree of inspiration as that of scripture. So you ask a typical Seventh-day Adventist pastor, he will say that Scripture alone is our authority. Ellen G. White, though, is, they recognize, as a prophetess. Uh, and, but if you uh, ask them the questions correctly, you'll find that they are taking, reading the Bible through the lenses, through the glasses, so to speak, of Ellen G. White's writings. She's the infallible interpreter, being a prophetess, of the Scriptures. She was alleged to have had some 2,000 visions and dreams and from them wrote extensively on Christian life and doctrine. She believed and taught that her inspired end-time revelations recovered many long hidden truths in the Bible. I took the precious Bible and surrounded it with the several testimonies for the church given for the people of God. Here, said I, the cases of nearly all are met. God has been pleased to give you line upon line and precept upon precept. Ellen G. White has been for years the prophetess of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and the leaders of that. Now they've had some squabble back and forth in their history about this, 
Uh, but they've always put the writings of Ellen G. White on par with Jesus and the scriptures. And unfortunately, if the two come in conflict, scriptures or Ellen G., then the leadership of the church is always siding with what Ellen G. White says. What the Seventh-day Adventists are trying to do is say that, the, that they hold that the Bible alone is, is inspired and, and infallible as, um, as explained by or as uh, interpreted by Ellen G. White. So you have uh, a lot of very unique doctrines, a very damaging to the gospel doctrines that are, are added on to the Word of God by Ellen G. White under the guise of the spirit of prophecy. Let's look at one last example of addition, this time from one of the fastest growing cults in America. I'm standing in front of just one of their many thousands of churches, this one located, ironically enough, on Trinity Lane. You'll understand the irony when we get to the next section of the presentation. These, quote, oneness Pentecostals, also known as the Jesus Only Movement, add to the scriptures not by questioning the authority and authenticity of the Bible, but rather by declaring that without the comparatively recent revelations of the Holy Spirit, the deeper truths of the Bible remain hidden from the historical church from the foreword of the UPCI's official Articles of Faith. With the coming of the Holy Spirit, the Word of the Lord became a new book. Truths, which had been hidden for many years, were made clear. In the year 1914 came the revelation on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The pivotal doctrines of the absolute deity of Jesus Christ and the baptism in His name became tenets of the faith. Well, I think it goes to the attempt to maintain the uniqueness of the cult's claim to revelation. Uh, if they can trace the restoration of that revelatory word to themselves, then they ha that's, that's a means of establishing their authority. Uh, and again, that becomes a matter of uh, where do we find the authority for the gospel resting? Is it in the Word or is it in the church? Is it in the one who preaches or is it in the scriptures themselves? By either undermining the authenticity and or sufficiency of the Bible and then adding their own scriptures or their own unique systems of interpretation, these groups have elevated themselves and their extra biblical teaching to the status of the one true, or at least the most true, faith. Now, we in no way want to lump all these groups together in regard to their degree of departure from historical Christianity. Had Sun Yun Moon been spreading his grotesque false gospel in the latter half of the 19th century, Ellen White might have condemned him just as fast as Charles Spurgeon. Nevertheless, by adding to the scriptural revelation that God has granted the Catholic or universal church, each of them has taken on the first mark of a cult. But most of these cults, self-appointed, self-trained, no real accountability to anybody, and they go off in all sorts of different directions because they've rejected creedal Christianity, and lo and behold, you have a cult. A cult is born. It is evil to pervert the Word of God. We've lost a lot of that in our postmodern society in thinking that someone's committing evil by what they teach. But if God has truly revealed His Word, then to pervert that Word, to, to minimize that Word, to put that Word as a subordinate authority under someone else's authority is truly a morally evil thing to do. Now we turn our focus, as the cults inevitably do, on the nature of God and His work in redemption. Subtraction is the second mark of a cult. This mark is present whenever a person or group subtracts from the triunity of God by either denying the personhood or the deity of one or more members of the Godhead. The doctrine of the Trinity, in a nutshell, is uh, the belief that there is one God who exists in three persons. Uh, another way that theologians put that is that God is one in His essence or being, three in person. 
We're not saying, as Christians, that there is one God and three gods at the same time. That's absurd. There's only one God, only one being, only one entity that is God. And yet, in some way that's very mysterious, that we cannot explain, uh, in this one God there are three persons, three personalities. Many who deny the doctrine of the Trinity object and say that it's not taught clearly in the Bible, particularly in the Old Testament. There are hints of the Trinity in the Old Testament. I don't believe we get a full-blown doctrine of the Trinity in the Old Testament, but the Old Testament does uh, suggest a doctrine of the Trinity. In Genesis 1.26, for example, God says, let us make man in our image. I believe that there is, at the very least, a hint of the triune personality of God. Consider Isaiah 48, 16. Come near to me, hear this. I have not spoken in secret from the beginning. From the time that it was, I was there. And now the Lord God and his spirit have sent me. Dr. Robert Morey notes in his nearly 600 page book, The Trinity, Evidence and Issues, if the passage is interpreted in its natural and normal meaning, there are three persons in this passage who are all God. But how can God be sent by God unless there are several persons within the Godhead? Since the Father sent the Son in Trinitarian theology, this is exactly the kind of passage which we would expect to find. The great Baptist scholar John Gill agrees. Here is a glorious testimony of a trinity of persons in the Godhead. Christ, the Son of God, is sent in human nature, and as mediator, Jehovah the Father and the Spirit are the senders of Him. While every member of the Trinity has been attacked at one time or another, the most common assault is on the eternal Son of God. The majority of cults today attempt to reduce Jesus to a creation of God as being either just a man or a lesser God. And in this they fulfill the biblical definition of what it means to be anti-Christ. Unfortunately, we're out of time. To understand the other three signifiers, subtraction, multiplication, and division, I hope you'll get the documentary, The Marks of a Cult. Meanwhile, in next week's show, we'll use our most popular documentary in recent memory to explore a related aspect in our War of the Worldviews. Just how are people saved by God? What part does adding our good works play in that process? I'm Eric Holmberg, and thanks for watching.